Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is truly an incredible case. The amount of courage and power this woman showed after going through literally the worst thing imaginable is truly amazing. It's overall a very sad and devastating case, but I'm really looking forward to telling you all about the story of Judy Malinowski. Judy Malinowski was born on August 26, 1983, being the first born to her parents. Judy was overall known as being from a loving family with a happy childhood. She had a younger brother named Patrick and a sister named Danielle, who she absolutely doted on and adored, and she was absolutely beautiful. Growing up, she won several beauty pageants, including being crowned Miss New Albany and homecoming queen at her high school, New Albany High School, in 2001. After graduating from high school, Judy went on to Ohio State University. Judy was known as being a beautiful person on the inside and out. She was known for her special ability to love all people unconditionally without judgment. She was passionate and loving with a free spirit and a quick wit. She was someone that could always make those around her smile and feel good. She was known to put others' needs before her own and was just overall the light in the lives of those who knew her. Judy's mother said that Judy always just wanted to have a simple, nice life. She wanted to live in a nice house, in a normal neighborhood, and she wanted two children. And it seemed that she was starting to live the life that she had always wanted. She was married to a man named Ron, and together the couple went on to have two daughters, Kaylin, who was born on March 12, 2004, and Madison, who was born in September of 2007. And of course, Judy loved her daughters. She called them the colors of her heart. Judy made sure to always make sure that her daughters felt loved and cared for. However, while Judy was pregnant with Madison, Ron cheated on Judy, and the relationship between Judy and Ron fell apart, and from there, of course, they broke up. Now, when Judy was younger, she had been diagnosed with ovarian cancer, which she did beat the first time, and she went into remission. However, by 2006, unfortunately, the cancer returned. After the cancer came back, the doctors performed a full hysterectomy on Judy, but that just led to more and more issues. Judy began to struggle with opioid abuse to deal with all of the pain that she was suffering from that surgery, which unfortunately was a very common occurrence during that time due to the overprescription of opioid drugs. It got to the point that her insurance stopped covering the opioids that she relied on, so unfortunately, she ended up turning to street drugs, and that got her hooked on heroin. Through that, though, her family worked hard to support her, help her raise her children, and do whatever they could to help her recover from her addiction. After a while, she did start to get back up on her feet, and she started to make really great progress. She had her own apartment, she was clean, she had gone to rehab, and she had been getting income via disability paychecks that she got due to her cancer and other issues, as well as her mother helping out with her bills. But by 2014, it was also around this time that a man named Michael Slager reached out to Judy via Facebook and the two quickly connected. Now, Michael and Judy had already known each other previously. Michael knew Ron and their other group of friends, and she had hung out with him and, you know, Ron and the other friends before. So, they knew each other, and after years of not seeing each other or talking, Michael reached out to Judy, and they reconnected. They went on their first date, and after that, the pair became almost inseparable. And during that time, Judy also slipped back into her addiction. What she didn't know about Michael at the time was that he had a long criminal history. He had passed criminal offenses for theft, stalking, domestic abuse, rape, battery, assault, breaking and entering, and child endangerment. She didn't know that she was bringing such a dangerous man into her life and into her family. The relationship between Michael and Judy was a very toxic one. The first incident that police got involved with was in May of 2015. The two would get into really aggressive verbal fights and Judy would either scream or she would fight back or she would leave and Michael was typically the one who would call 911 on Judy to report these incidences. So what would happen sometimes is like 
the two would fight and Judy would lock herself in her room to get away from him or she would scream back or try to fight back in any way that she could. However, after call after call, eventually adding up to over 30 different incident calls, police got the feeling that Michael was calling the police so often as a way to control Judy and scare her into submission. They believed that he used this as a way to basically say, like, the cops are on my side, they know that you're abusive, you're gonna get in trouble if, you know, we keep fighting like this, etc. Also, while the two dated, Michael would supply Judy with the drugs that she was taking, even though he did not use any drugs himself. So, to me, that says that Basically, he liked that she was dependent on drugs, which therefore made her more dependent on him since he was the one who was getting the drugs for her. So if she was dependent on the drugs, he was the one that was always getting them for her, keeping her addicted, keeping her coming back for more. That also kept her coming back to Michael because she needed him. Things got so bad in the relationship between them to the point that Bonnie, Judy's mother, tried several times to get Judy out of the relationship. But every time she tried, Judy said that she was scared. She was scared of what would happen if she left Michael. She said that Michael had threatened her life on several occasions if she did try to leave. And she did try to get help from the police on a few occasions. One time, she recalls calling the police and asking them for help, but it seemed that even though she told the police that she was afraid that Michael was going to kill her, they didn't seem all that concerned at the time. The vibe that Bonnie and the rest of Judy's family got from the police was that they just thought of Judy as this past junkie, that she got herself into drugs and that it was her own problem to deal with, that, you know, she was into drugs and that this is what's really causing her issues. The family felt that the police just did not take Judy seriously during this time. However, by August of 2015, that is when Judy finally decided that the best thing for her was to get away. She decided to go to rehab not only to recover from her addiction, but to also get away from Michael. So, on August 2nd, 2015, Michael agreed to drive her to rehab. But when she got to the rehab facility, she decided that she wasn't ready. This rehab facility allowed her to bring cigarettes with her and she didn't have any at the time, so she wanted to go to the store and get some cigarettes to bring with her to rehab, but she also wanted to talk to her family beforehand and let them know everything that was going on. But as they were driving from the rehab facility to the gas station, the two kept arguing and fighting and fighting and fighting. So, by the time they got to the gas station to get the cigarettes, things got very heated. Michael went inside of the Speedway gas station to get the cigarettes while Judy ran to the back of the Speedway to get some time to herself. But Michael came out and kind of drove around to the back and found her in the back of the Speedway. And at that time, Michael got out of the truck and the argument got much more intense. Witnesses report that Judy splashed her soda on Michael, so Michael responded by going back to his truck, getting a canister of gasoline, and pouring it on Judy. Then, Michael was seen returning to his car where he grabbed a lighter. It's been reported that he either grabbed the lighter out of his car or he grabbed it out of his pocket, but he did return to the car and come back a few seconds later. Then, he went over to Judy and he set her on fire. Witnesses frantically called 911 after witnessing this and it showed that Michael literally sat there and watched as Judy burned alive and the way that she lit and immediately ignited into roaring flames. Onlookers knew that this was something terrible. It didn't look like anything close to an accident. By the time officers arrived and spoke with Michael, he originally tried telling them that the whole thing was an accident. He said that Judy was getting gas when a little bit splashed on her. Then she caught fire when she was using a lighter to try to light a cigarette. But officers could tell that this isn't even close to what happened. Her entire body was on fire and it was so hot that her clothes had been melting off. It was just horrible. So then, Michael changed his story. He admitted that the two were fighting and Judy splashed her soda on him, so he responded by splashing her with gas from a container that he had in the car. But he said that things actually calmed down. So, she pulled out a cigarette and he went to go light it for her 
and that is when she caught on fire. But police quickly found surveillance video from a nearby bank that clearly showed him pouring gas on Judy and then going to his car and then lighting her on fire. And of course, when questioning the witnesses, they confirmed that it looked like he purposely set Judy on fire. So immediately, Judy was sent to the hospital where she was not expected to survive. They expected her to live for a couple hours or a couple of days, but not anything beyond that. She had third and fourth degree burns on over 90% of her body, which is just horrific. She underwent over 50 different surgeries and procedures, including several infections that started, multiple fevers, dressing changes for all of the burns, which can be excruciatingly painful. She had to get skin graft surgeries, reconstruction surgeries, many of which did fail. She lost all of her hair, she lost several fingers, and she lost her ears. She laid in a coma for weeks, and throughout her stay, she coded many times, requiring life-saving measures. She struggled to breathe, she couldn't move her body, and if she did, she had excruciating pain. But through all of this, Judy fought. She fought like hell, with her children and her family surrounding her. Even when she was in a coma, her family said that she grit her teeth and she was determined to survive so that she could tell her story. At the same time, Michael was arrested and charged with aggravated arson and felony assault. Again, because Judy survived, he knew that Judy would be able to testify at his trial and he knew that seeing Judy in the condition she was in and hearing the words of what she suffered would make a jury even more motivated to put him behind bars for as long as they could. So he pled no contest to the charges and for this, he was sentenced to 11 years behind bars. That was the maximum amount of time that someone could be charged with this type of sentence. But of course, given that he was only going to serve 11 years was just heartbreaking to Judy's family. Judy suffered constant pain. She was permanently disfigured. She would never be the same. From her hospital bed, Judy wanted to live so that she could make the changes that she wanted to see. She wanted the laws around this type of charge to be changed. At the same time as Judy clung to life, her condition started to get worse. But she spoke with investigators and it was clear that Judy had a clear memory of what happened and she wanted to speak her truth. So after almost a year and a half, she started to wean off of her pain medications, which happened over the duration of a few weeks, enduring even more pain and suffering just so she could prove that she was in the right state of mind to tell her story. She knew that there was a possibility that she might die, and with that, she wanted to testify against Michael in the inevitable murder trial that would come after she died. So she did. When speaking about the events of that day, she spoke clearly and forcefully. She was questioned by the prosecution as well as cross-examined by Michael's lawyer. When speaking about that day, she said that Michael had been taking her to this rehab center where she was supposed to check in, but like I said, she decided at that time that she didn't want to go right then and there. She decided that before committing herself, she wanted to talk to her daughters and her mother about the whole thing, so they left rehab and stopped at a gas station, that Speedway. When they got to the gas station, again, Judy wanted to pick up more cigarettes since she was allowed to bring them to rehab and she was completely out of cigarettes at that time. That is important to note that she literally had zero cigarettes. She didn't have any left and that is why she wanted to go to the gas station to get more. But throughout the entire car ride, the two were arguing. So when Michael went inside the Speedway to get the cigarettes, Judy got out of the car and again went behind the speedway by herself to get some space. But when Michael got out of the gas station, obviously he saw that Judy was no longer in the truck, so he got in the truck and then pulled around to the back of the gas station to follow her. That is when he found her behind the Safeway and he pulled up next to her and demanded that she get into the truck. Michael got out of the car and the two argued for quite some time and Judy admits that she threw the cup of pop at Michael, which splashed all over him. Again, she said that she threw the entire cup at him and everything spilled on him, not just like splashing it out at him. So Michael ran around to the other side of the truck, grabbed the big canister of gas and poured gas all over her body. He started at her head, poured some down her throat, 
and then he covered the rest of her body. Judy said that as he was pouring the gasoline, he looked like pure evil. He didn't look like this was a joke. He wasn't doing this in a playful way, if there even is a playful way to do this. He looked evil. He would not respond to her screams or her cries for help. He just wanted to do whatever he could to her while screaming at her and insulting her the entire time. So you, while he went inside, you got out of the truck and went behind that speedway. There's a bank there, right? Yes. Uh, and uh, what happened as you uh, stood behind that speedway? Oh, my might in a matter of no time at all, around in his truck. Uh, he saw me and immediately slammed the truck into the park, got out, demanded that I got into the truck with him, called me all sorts of names. Uh, we argued for a good five to ten minutes, and then I threw my pop on him. You threw a pop he, on him? Yes. Uh, did you splash it on him or actually throw the cup at him? I threw the cup at him. Okay, and this cup, was it uh, a hard plastic or paper or what was it made out of? I believe it was a styrofoam cup. Okay. Uh, did the drink get on him? Yes. What was his reaction to this? He was extremely upset. And what did he do? He ran around to the other side of his truck and he got his uh, of gasoline that he had cut on the back of his truck. Uh, it was a really big and had a lot of gas. He ran around with me and started pouring gasoline, started up my head and worked his way down. Some got through my throat as he did that. And, uh, that burnt really bad. The gasoline in your throat burnt really bad? Yes. And uh, what, what happened as a result of having this gasoline poured on you? I fell down and I was leaning on my right side, holding myself with my right arm and hand. Okay. When you trip and you're falling the, and, and you're laying there holding yourself up on one hand uh, and he's pouring gasoline on you, what's his demeanor as he's pouring the gasoline on you? Evil, just completely evil. He's not he's not responding to any of my cries for help. He won't tell me why. He just is like you want to throw something on some, or you want to throw a cop on me. See what I'll do to you, bitch. And how do you like this? And just all sorts of longer names. Okay. So Judy, was, was this a joking demeanor? You poured something on me, I'm gonna no. pour something on you, ha ha, isn't this funny? No, it was an evil demeanor. Okay. After he poured the gasoline on you, what happens next? He backed away from me for about 30 seconds and I kept telling him to please help me and stop and I'll get, I'll get the truck, I'll go with you. You know, um, why, how, why would you do this? And I looked at him and he pulled a lighter out of his pocket and he started walking towards me. And I just remember crying and begging for help. And he let me on fire and the look in his eyes were, his eyes went back literally after I was set on fire and he, that's when his eyes just turned black as I screamed for his help. Okay. He did nothing. But even after screaming for help and asking him to stop, saying that she would just come with him if he stopped, he didn't listen. He reached into his pocket, grabbed his lighter, and set her on fire. She made it clear that he was in a state of anger. He looked evil. He didn't want to make up with her, and it wasn't an accident. He was malicious, evil, and purposeful. Then she described how it felt to be set on fire. She said it felt like a thousand needles all penetrating her body at one time. Judy, tell me how that moment felt when you were ignited. It felt horrible. I don't think words can describe what it feels like to have your whole body set on fire. 
I carry a number of fire out of my face and eyes. I can remember screaming for help. I can remember looking over and seeing him just standing there staring at me with the look in his face that was just like I keep saying over and over again, pure evil. Like there's no other words to describe it. My whole body felt like the worst burn you could ever feel in your life. Okay. And it stung, and it was like a thousand needles going in, a thousand hot needles penetrating my body. I, I guess that's the best way I can explain it. And I just remember, like I said, begging him to help, pleading for any help, trying to get the fire off of my face. Eventually, burying my face in the grass and walking around. And then um, I got to the point where I couldn't see anything and everybody's voices were sounding far away. I could tell there was definitely somebody around, but I couldn't hear them or make it out. I thought for sure I was dying. I just prayed to Jesus to please forgive me for my sins. and to take care of my children, and that was it. I blacked out, and I don't remember anything until I woke up in the hospital. During cross-examination, of course, Michael's attorney brought up her own drug use history, how there were several times that Michael accused Judy of stealing things, of trying to take her own life, and things like that. But she said that none of those things were true, that he made all of those things up just to have more control over her. They also talked about the day of the incident, and Michael's attorney brought up that Judy had been on drugs at the time that this entire incident took place. Then Michael's attorney basically asked why she didn't run away from the time that he poured gas on her during the 30 seconds while he walked away and grabbed the lighter and came back. She basically explained that 30 seconds goes by a lot faster than you think. She was just trying to get the gas off of her at that time. She had an issue with her shoe, so that also made it hard for her to stand back up at the time because as he was pouring gas on her, she like fell over and was either sitting or lying and it made it hard to get back up after he had done that. And she said that she really didn't want to run away. She just wanted to plead with Michael. She didn't run away because she was pleading with him to just let her come back in the truck, that she would come with him if he didn't hurt her anymore. That's basically how and why it happened the way it did. So Judy gave her deposition in January of 2017, and unfortunately, less than five months later, on June 27th, 2017, Judy passed away from her injuries. And immediately, Michael was charged with her murder. When she gave her deposition, she was asked what she wanted to happen to Michael if she were to die from her injuries. And she said that she wanted Michael to be charged with murder and she wanted him to face a life sentence. So by July of 2018, Michael Slager pleaded guilty to charges of murder and as part of the plea agreement, he was sentenced to life in prison. Judy didn't want Michael to face the same fate as her. She wanted Michael to spend his life in jail, and she hoped that he would become a better person, which is such a brave and selfless way to look at it. I promise I would not have that same forgiveness in my heart if someone did something like this to me. Absolutely no way. So she was just very strong, and she wanted to forgive him and she wanted him to become a better person after what he did to her. Also, before Judy died, her daughters and her mother said that Judy's very last words were telling her daughters that she loved them and to always remember that they are the colors of her heart. Throughout all of this, as I mentioned earlier, Judy's daughters and her family worked hard to push for tougher legislation in Ohio for assaults that leave the victim permanently disfigured and on September 7th, 2017, Judy's law was enacted into Ohio law. This law increases the prison sentence for people who intentionally disfigure another person in their attack. 
Another interesting thing to this case was that investigators were talking about how it was a very unique opportunity for them to be able to speak with the murder victim and get her side of things and have her tell her story. And again, tell them exactly what she wanted to happen to Michael because obviously in most murder cases, the person is already deceased by the time police get there. So they said this was a very unique and amazing opportunity to be able to speak with the victim and get her thoughts and tell her story about everything that happened before she ultimately passed away from her injuries. And I think that that's pretty incredible as well. So that is all I have for today's video. And of course, Judy is such an inspiration for so many reasons. She literally went through so much in her life through the cancer, through addiction, and yet she still found the power and strength to stand up for herself, for her children, and other victims like her. She even wanted what was best for Michael after what he did to her, which truly goes to show what kind of person she is. This is such a sad and disgusting case with a very, very sad ending, but I wanted to make sure that I told you all Judy's incredible story. Again, everything that happened is horrible, but I'm so happy that she lived to tell her story and that she lived to make sure that people knew this was not an accident, that Michael was pure evil, and that she suffered greatly because of what he did. But that is all I have for today's video, and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that Michael deserved to be forgiven by Judy, and do you think that he should have faced the death penalty, or do you think life in prison is enough of a sentence for him? Let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Make sure you go ahead and check out the links that I have down below. One of them is the website for Judy's Foundation, so make sure to go ahead and check that page out. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below as well. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below as well. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.